All right, I think we might as well just get started here. Looks like we have a good amount of people already here. It's exciting. Let's see here. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Corey Ayanaji, and I'm the Ballantine Gallery Manager at History Colorado Center and the coordinator of the Vosis and Arte programming. Before we begin, in the spirit of healing and education, we want to acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archaeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. We are so delighted to have you all here with us today. Fosas and Arte was created in partnership with the Latino Cultural Arts Center to coincide with History Colorado Center's newest exhibit, Echo in Colorado. For more information about the exhibit, you can check out the website and I am going to post, put that in the chat right now. We are so thrilled to bring together artists for a seven part series of conversations to talk about the importance of Mexicano and Chicano art in the state of Colorado. So before we move on to introductions, I first I'd like to explain how this program is going to work digitally. The first thing I want to talk about is the chat box. This is where I'll be sharing program resources like the link I had just shared below. And this is where you will be able to communicate with me and the artists. If you have tech questions, this is where you will put them. Some people might not see dialogue boxes the same on tablets and phones, depending on if it's Android or Mac. So we will do our best to accommodate all devices. At the end of the program, we will have some time for questions and answers. Please write them in the chat box, or if you'd actually like to ask the question yourself, just simply write, I have a question, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. And I also just want to mention again that we do have a live Spanish interpreter for the duration of this program. If you would like to use this service, please tap the interpretation icon and select Spanish and then select mute original sound. If you would like to go back to hearing the program in English, select the interpretation icon again and click off. Do not select the English tab or you will not hear anything. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the moderator of our program, Adriana Arbarca. Adriana is the founder of the Latino Cultural Arts Center. She was born and raised in Northwest Denver and holds a BA degree in Latin American Studies from CU Boulder. After graduating, she worked in the arts in San Francisco for five years, including at the Mexican Museum, and traveled extensively throughout the United States and Mexico to build her knowledge of cultural representation. Her parents started the Abarca family collection as a way of supporting the work of artist friends in Colorado and Mexico. Currently, she is the exhibiting curator for the HO in Colorado exhibit now on view at History Colorado. Please welcome Adriana. Thank you very much, Corey. On behalf of Team LCAC, welcome to all the guests tonight. And a special shout out to Leo Tanguma, a local muralist of, uh, and long time friend of the LCAC and also his wife, Jean. So I'm going to start out by first giving you a little introduction to Jolt and Juan Fuentes. Uh, Jolt is a graffiti writer, fine artist, muralist, and curator with over 20 years of experience creating public art and experiences in experience it has experience in hosting radio, creative consulting, and public speaking. He creates commercial murals, participates in live art performance, and enjoys curating, curating events around art. And then we'll be introducing Juan Fuentes, who's a documentary photographer born in Chihuahua, Mexico, who grew up in Denver's North Side neighborhood. His kinship to the barrio is evident within his photography, telling the intimate stories of everyday immigrants and Chicanos. As a chronicler of life in Denver, when he isn't photographing, he curates the content for Old Denver's Instagram account, a visual record reminiscent of historic Denver before and after the influx of gentrification and displacement of people of culture. So welcome, guys. Uh, good to have you tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you. 
So we have the names a little on, um, actually it's Joel, here's on the left-hand side, at least on my screen. I don't know how everyone else is seeing it. There's Joel and oh. then Juan with the, the cachucha. Good to see you, Juan. So we're gonna start out by, uh, with, with this image by Juan called the Sunnyside Temple. And uh, Juan, can you tell us uh, when this photograph was taken and where you took it? And also what the subject is of the image? Yeah, so um, this photo was taken at La Raza Park. Um, this is actually Jolt's 53 Bel Air. Um, and it was taken in, um, it was part of the promotion going into Bobby Lefebvre's uh, Northside play. Um, and we had uh, gathered at La Baza Park to take some promotional photos and uh, Joe rolled up with his 53. And um, yeah, this was kind of just like a shot on the side that, that was taken just kind of on the spot, whatever. So this photo was taken uh, last year sometime then, wasn't it? Yeah. Because I know uh, Bobby's play, um, Northside, showed up at Su Teatro last year. Um, I don't remember when exactly, but so I, this is a pretty recent photo. And um, how long have you had that uh, Bel Air for, Joel? Um, I've had it for about four years. But when I got it, it looked like that. So I, you, we got it there pretty quickly. Normally it takes a lot longer. For those who don't know, can you tell them the significance of the, the writing on the back sunny side? Yeah, um, so that's what we always call the neighborhood. I grew up there. We always considered it the sunny side. Um, I was born in, you know, 81 in the north side. I went straight to the north side from DG. And that's always, if we weren't saying north side, we were saying we were from the sunny side. And that was the way that we distinguished that part of North Denver we were from. Uh, and then the Pachuco cross in the middle, which um, a lot of people in my family have had tattooed on them. And, and it's just a significant tattoo and something that we've seen our whole life. So for those who aren't familiar, um, Columbus, uh, the historic Columbus Park, supposedly Columbus Park, we've called it La Raza since the, I would say late 60s, early 70s. And um, maybe you guys could Talk a little bit about what's going down in the neighborhood uh, recently with um, our city councilwoman, uh, Amanda Sandoval. Um, so the move right now is that we renamed the park officially to La Raza and that's nothing new. That's something that our forefathers have been fighting for for a long time, but it's really looking like we're gonna do it the sign that we see that everybody's looking at right now is removed. I think the, the current climate helps us with this move, but I also think that the, um, my generation and before growing up and seeing generations before us and before us and handing down that torch, now we're, now we're in city council. Now we're not, you know, not that we haven't been been before but right now a lot of people are fighting for what's right and the right thing to do is to to give this park its, its official name it's always been called which is La Raza Park. So Joel since you grew up near the park maybe a block from there do you remember when that uh, pyramid went up? I I remember um, yeah I remember when the pyramid went up and I also remember like towards the end of the pool so I remember the park being big mounds of dirt uh, I remember those days where we were playing in the dirt as they were creating the construction. Um, so that's, that's my, that's my era, my generations. So what kind of emotions did it uh, raise in you when you saw that pyramid constructed? I didn't have the maturity to understand it on the level of which I do today. I was a little kid. I was a little boy. Um, I was just playing in the park. I was just, I was just in my, my community. But uh, growing with that pyramid, that pyramid has, has been literally a temple for us. That's where we, as Northsiders, as kids from the sunny side from La Raza Park, that's where we gather. That's, that's where we, um, we celebrate losses of our people there. I pray there. That's church to me. Um, 
um, connected to it through and through. That's a symbol that, that represents my culture. Were there any other symbols in on the north side that, that meant as much to you as the pyramid? Uh, in terms of landmarks or just? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the mural on top of Aslan Rec Center, the mural that was behind Aslan, uh, the murals on the side of Servicio de la Raza, um, the, you know, um, I mean, I can go on and on. The, the, I can go on and on. There's a lot, but mainly it was the public art that, that probably I would say stood out to me the more, more than anything. So do you think your family's background in art had more influence on you or the public art or a combination of the two? Maybe you can talk a little bit about your, your father and your grandmother and, and their interest in, in art. So my grandmother was an art teacher at uh, Ebert and she's from Monta Vista. Before that, her parents are from Chihuahua and they lived in the east side and my grandmother taught there. So I grew up with all of my uncles being creative in one way or another and my dad himself being uh, an artist and musician. Um, art was something that we were taught in our home. I think that um, the importance of that, of what you're exposed to in the home, um, you know, sets you up for what you'll be exposed to and what you'll absorb in the world and the art and the culture that I absorbed in my own home um, set me up for a better understanding of what I was seeing. When I was looking at the murals in the community, I wasn't only taking those images in, but I was wondering how they created them. I was wondering about the technical process of it. Uh, and I understood that by watching art get created within my own home. Um, so, so Juan, did you have any art growing up in the home? Um, I know you're originally from Chihuahua, but you spent uh, most of your life on the North side. Uh, what art were you exposed to as a young man? Yeah, <clears throat> I didn't have it much directly at home. Uh, more of my influence was as a kid looking at um, Lowrider magazine, but mostly uh, the, the Lowrider Arte magazine. Mm -hmm. um, that influenced me a lot. As a, like, ever since I can remember, I, I was collecting those magazines. I was, I was going to the 7-Eleven on 26th and Federal and, and, buy, and just saving my lunch money to, to buy those magazines. But aside from that, I think the influence on public art as well, uh, both graffiti and murals. Uh, I think I was real young when I was picking up and looking at the, at the graffiti that was around. I think I remember seeing the gorilla before I even knew Joel at all, you know? Um, so that's Joel's uh, gorilla where you're referring to, huh? But also, so, Middle school, not that uh, Leo Tangumas in in the room uh, actually helped uh, paint a mural with uh, Leo in, in middle school. Um, so which that school was this? This, this is a uh, Lake Lake, well, isn't it? I had I had left Lake um, in eighth grade for the, the the second half of eighth grade, and uh, went to Scott Carpenter, and Leo Tanguma did a mural there at the cafeteria, and uh, oh. the, the class of us helped him out with that. Okay, I think and have, so, hey, on that, your, on that note, could I step in? Huh? And sure. Leo, uh -huh. was your art studio ever in Lakeside Mall? In yes, the, it was. Yes, so it was. When I was a little boy, I remember we would go to Scream Street, which was the haunted <laughs> house in, in Lakeside in the basement. Uh -huh. And me being just the little boy that I was, I was walking, hitting the doorknobs on the doors looking for Green <laughs> Street and the door opened and I walked in and you were creating art in there. And I was a little, yeah. I opened the door and you were in there like <laughs> creating a huge mural. Right. And, uh, that always resonated with me. And still to this day, I just <laughs> found them, like, yeah, how did that happen? Beautiful. How did that uh, moment uh, occur where I just opened that <laughs> door and you were in there? But so, uh, I, yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those, so good to, uh, that you guys remember. I'm so glad for that. And those um, murals I was doing at the Lakeside Center were the airport murals. Yeah. So that's, yeah. What, that's what we did, all of them. Wow, so good. And I, I remember this young man on the right <laughs> a, a little bit, you know. 
I had a great time doing that one at um, um, at um, Scott's Carpenter Middle School. Yeah. So, Juan, can you tell us a little bit more about this image in front of us, uh, Mi Raza? Um, yeah, um, this is a friend of mine. Um, we, we took this photo. We were doing a, a, a video for um, promoting an event we had a couple years ago. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're uh, filming in a video in promotion for an event we had a couple years ago. And, um, he, you know, the way we do things, we never try to, like, set up things or, or like, try to uh, stage things in any way. But, you know, this is a friend of mine, and he was actually just hanging out on the side uh, while people were filming another thing. And, he, you know, this is the way he dresses. This is the way he was representing himself. Um, and yeah, I just captured this. I feel like I capture a lot of things on the sidelines. Um, and this is one image that, that I think, um, for me, it represented a lot of like what my identity is. You know, Nirvasa carries a, a strong, um, powerful message when it comes to the representation of Mexicanos or Chicanos. Um, so yeah. how, is it, how is it that you were able to merge the two um, the two very distinctive cultures that you, the one that you came from and what you had in your home being Mexicano and the one on the streets on the north side, which was primarily Chicano. How were you able to merge the two realities? I mean, I don't think there's much separation from them. I know historically there might be some division between them, but to me kind of being able to be in the in-between, I never saw separation from them. Um, you know, I am an immigrant myself and had a very Mexicano household. Spanish was my first language. You know, I still speak it to this day, daily at home. But like you said, I grew up with a lot of Chicanos on, on the street when I was out, you know, just hanging around, skateboarding, whatever. Uh, when I wasn't at home, it was, I was always surrounded by Chicanos and, you know, living in the North side, it's inevitable. And there is some immigrant culture in between all that. But I felt like I never saw separation between us. I always felt comfortable with both. I never really saw the separation or felt any way. Um, but I know there's some division between all that, but I felt like I was put in a particular space at a, at a particular time where I think I was able to see more of the parallels or more of the, the similarities than I ever saw any type of differences. So I think uh, you were met Jolt maybe about four years ago um, through his artwork and through social media. And I think what probably uh, bonded the two of you was also car culture. Can you, uh, make, Jolt, maybe talk about your connection to car culture, where, where that came from? Yeah, I grew up with it. Um, I grew, my dad used to paint cars, he used to do interior. My brother takes after my dad in that way. He paints cars. Um, my my car seat was in an Impala. I am plus, I'm from 39th and Navajo, so walking to 7-Eleven was a car show. Um, you know, growing up in La Raza Park was a car show. Um, so I fell in love with with the, the low riders and hot rods and the bombas and all of that since I was a little boy. I just grew into it, and, and, and I have cars. So does Juan. We both, we both have the riders. We drive our cars, too. So have, do you consider that also one of your artistic um, outlets or expressions? Absolutely. I, mm -hmm. the, the low rider in itself, the, the idea of it conceptually, the, this, this, this celebration of the american industry that 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 bow at one point and isn't ever going to be that but it is a testament to this americana which i feel as chicanos we we appreciate a, a, a an americana in a way that a lot of people haven't seen it but to take this this machine this this you know mechanical and even design wise like um marvel to to what has been created by by man and, and to take it and make it ours in a specific way and then everything that comes with it, the idea of why they put hydraulics on it, because they were getting like profiled 
and, and, and they outsmarted the cops with that ingenuity of being able to raise the car because they were getting pulled over because it was lower. And, you know, and, and then you top it off with adorn it with gold and put a mural of an Aztec on there. That is, to me, one of the most incredible um, conceptual pieces of art that I've seen and the recreation of that over and over and the way people pay homage to uh, yesteryears of it and also they take it to a next level and surprise you too. That, I mean, hanging out at Berkeley on Sunday is more than just hanging out. It's, it's deep and yeah, I, I love the cars. I really do. Great. So uh, you guys just had this um, uh, a drive down the a feds um, celebration and maybe could tell the audience a little bit more about um, how you went about creating that um, event and uh, what it means to you guys, um, how, you, how you came to collaborate on this for the first time last year and then uh, created a, a, su a successful event again this year and maybe what some of your plans are for the years coming up. I mean, the idea sparked from Joel, so I think, I think it'd be great to talk about that. I, um, I, would, I started to notice how we were being harassed and, and how the culture was treated. And I didn't feel like it was fair because growing up in it, I felt like we were, we were celebrating something very significant. And the way that we were treated cruising federal um, with these, these cars, I, I just felt like it needed to be celebrated instead of criminalized. Uh, so I would always bring up to certain friends of like, yo, how could we make this happen? Instead of these cops policing us out here, how could they be making sure that this cruise goes smoothly and celebrating it? Um, and then we realized that the undertones of that, of that celebration could have some radical influence too. Let's cruise to La Raza Park and let's get a proclamation from the city. And when they read the language of it, let's make sure that it calls it La Raza Park. So when city council announces it, then we are rewriting history. And even if the law hasn't been changed yet, we've still snuck in the language into it. And that's also snuck in the idea of celebration of this. So we're gathering. When you see them bikers out there, when you see them, them lowriders out there, those are some strong men. And when you see us in unity, uh, and then you have city council there, and we're supporting these people, and we're moving forward in that sense, then, then it has a a purpose beyond celebrating just the aesthetic qualities and the art and getting together and our people, but now we're moving forward. Uh, so that was ultimately the goal. And I think that's what we have accomplished. And I, I think the goal is now to one day have a 50 year anniversary, just like Chicano Park just, just celebrated and to carry on that tradition. Holding space, that's what the cars do. They hold the streets, they hold the parks, they bring people around. And even though we got ran out of our neighborhood because it was gentrified, we can still hold space in those parks. Um, but you know what, it's, it's time to change the name and all of those things. So that was the, that was the intent. So we're gonna go on and, and talk a little bit more about some of your pieces, Jolt. Um, you've been doing um, spray can art since you were probably about 12 years old, as far as I know. And um, I'd like to know, you know, what really inspires you to pick up, um, pick up graffiti and spray can as a form of expression? I think the timing um, for the, when I was born, the generation, what had occurred in the neighborhood before I was born, I think that, um, the push of Chicano artists creating murals, but also at the same time, the, the New York graffiti scene um, had just became so popular and within movies and all that. And even though it was going on in the Bronx in the 70s and 80s, it didn't really hit us until the 90s because it came to us via Hollywood. It was it was through movies. And, you know, I was renting uh, movies at Blockbuster and things like that. I'm saying graffiti. Uh, the culture of it. I always seen it. And, and as a, as like just a little neighborhood kid, we were hanging out in abandoned buildings and train yards. And that's just kind of how we grew up exploring the city. Denver was a different place. It was, you know, a lot of abandoned buildings and we were in there um, and art in the household and all that. I don't know. It was just, it was an outlaw art that I appreciated. Um, it spoke to me and it was right there in the community. It, it was popular. Most kids did graffiti art in 
middle school and high school. By high school, it kind of started to fade out the popularity. But when I was in middle school, m most people did graffiti in the neighborhood. They had a tag. That was just kind of what we did. So how did you end up sticking with it? And a lot of, you know, a lot of kids start out and do their tags and this and that and have their, their, their books, their sketchbooks and stuff. Uh, but how did you, you make it last? How did your love affair last with uh, graffiti I through all these years? I mean, you've been, you're still at it. Yeah, I traveled and I seen what was going on and what other people like me from different places were doing. And I understood the, the bigger picture of it. Uh, and I got, I got schooled. I, I, I learned, I, I, was, I was given knowledge by older graffiti writers. I learned to study the culture uh, and, and I grew with it and my identity grew with it. And then it became something that, you know, in the neighborhood, you get recognition for it. You get a little bit of fame. You put your name up. You're good at it. People acknowledge you. That's something that keeps most people around. But I think following the, the art of it, uh, understanding, like, the depth of creating abstract letters, of using these symbols and rearranging them uh, while, while also appreciating what a, that letter is, um, I just grew with that within itself. But then the culture of graffiti too, the, the people of graffiti uh, was another reason because a lot of my personal relationships some of my best friends are, are graffiti writers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could mention to the audience that you have a, a couple pieces up um, at uh, the Echo and Colorado exhibit um, being held at History Colorado. What, we have your jumpsuit. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that jumpsuit, the history behind that jumpsuit and the patches on it and what that jumpsuit has seen. <laughs> yeah, it's just something that I lived in. I felt like um, what I wanted to, to showcase, that was a part of it. Um, I think that's the important part of it. Like, you see it. You can't deny it. There's, there's been some miles put on that thing. I, I, you know, I really lived in it. I, and, and I think it's a testament to the lifestyle that I live. I think that all those colors and all those paint and all that layer um, is just shows a bit of dedication. Um, yeah. And when did you create your uh, guerrilla or guerrilla or like the really is probably reference to guerrero or a warrior. Um, when did you create your guerrilla character? Um. I'm not even sure the date. It's it's been it's been like 15 years almost um, that I created that character, um, and yeah, it's something that I'm known for. There's a lot of styles that I work in, but that one was created out of necessity because I it wasn't really good to write my name on things anymore. As I started to have my career and people started to know who I was, and I wasn't hiding my face, uh, so I created something that was was almost like an alias um, and could fit certain rooftops. It, but it was it was created because the name Guerrilla Garden, the idea and the concept already existed. Uh, so that's why I went with the gorilla. And also, if you know, um, like the culture of the north side too, we really embrace gorillas on a whole because... And it wasn't because of Casa Bonita, right? No, nah, it was because... <laughs> It was because I just uh, had to I had to stick that in there. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> Nothing to do with Casa Bonita. <laughs> Nothing to do with them. <laughs> yeah. So um, we're going to talk a little bit more about your work, Jolt, if that's cool. Um, can you yeah. tell us a little bit more about this uh, Laird and Hall commission that you got just, um, I think it was last year, right? Yeah, this is... Um, this is like the last, what I would consider large scale project that I did. Um, you know, large scale projects don't come around all that much on this, on this scale. All, all these murals are on the same building. So the one with the hands, that's the west side of the building. The, the flowers are on the east side of the building. And then the butterflies are in, on the, um, the lobby, in the lobby. So for those who don't know, can you tell them where, uh, what Laredon Hall is and where it's located? Yeah, Laredon Hall is in Globeville. I grew up down the street from Laredon Hall. Um, and Laredon Hall is the first school of its kind to serve people that have mental disabilities. 
uh, and as well as physical disabilities. Um, in the 50s, there, there was a woman that had two sons named Larry and Don. That's why it's called Laird and Hall. And they had, a, they had disabilities and they were not accepted into public school. So she created a, a home to help and, and care for people that needed extra care. And it was originally that old blue house, Victorian house on 29th and Federal. Uh, and then later, the Alps Club bought the building, which was a Globe Bill, which was a school at one point, and that later became Laird and Hall. Uh, this part of it is Laird and Hall is now developing affordable housing and Globe Bill. So the butterflies that we're looking at, those are painted on the interior of one of the buildings. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a room where clients um, work with people or, or um, there's, there's therapists that work with their clients um, and th they work with people. There's physical therapy that goes on there. There's counseling. There's all sorts of things. Um, it's a cool spot. It, it, it's always served the community. Laird has been there forever. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, they've been there since I believe, I don't want to misquote, so I don't want to say it, but we, I made a documentary on it. Um, and if anybody wants to look it up, it's just Jolt Laird and Hall. And I, I documented the whole process of this. Uh, there's interviews, there's interviews with the community, there's interviews with Emmanuel Martinez. Um, and you can also see the process of it being painted. Yeah, I, I highly recommend that video. Um, it's, it's very informative and I, and I love your connection to the community that you grew up. Uh, when you left the North side, I know you, you went to live up in Glowville, so I love that you can now connect with your your um, your other um, barrio. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're going to just show a couple of the, the pieces that you've created. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the work that has more the the blues and um, purple co and gold um, color scheme? Yeah. I don't have a name for that piece or where it's located. Maybe it you could tell us a little bit more. It's graffiti art, um, and not graffiti in the sense of the true essence of, of illegal graffiti painted on a train or a wall, but this is, this is a byproduct of that, which is abstracted typography. Both of these pieces you're seeing on the screen are um, an opportunity for me and another friend that both do graffiti. These are both people from Miami. One is a female, one is me and reds, the yellow, green, purple pieces. And the other one that's more blue, more cool colors, that's Mia Meps. And he's a, a respected graffiti artist from, from Dade County, from Miami. These pieces were created on the spot. These are things that we showed up. We packed up a whole van of paint. We didn't pick out the color scheme. We, we know our letters. We know how we move letters. And we also complemented each other's pieces, too. If you notice, so these are two names with a character in the middle. The last thing we decided is what are we going to put in the middle so that where it looks like 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 a Virgin Mary or it looks like a saint and it has a galaxy in it uh -huh. that was created on the spot we painted that probably at like three o'clock in the morning after after painting all day and we needed to finish it so we we created we figured that out and both of us painted it simultaneously here in Denver did you do that piece in Denver well that's on burrito giant these are both off of 38th oh, okay. one is on Burrito Giant, and then the other uh -huh. is down the block on the old Country Gentleman liquor store. And we change these walls all the time. So the, the first one's gone. Uh, now that wall has a, a Monte Carlo hitting switches, a life-size Monte Carlo going down 38th, and it's hopping. Uh, mm -hmm. And Juan helped, helped us with that one. And that was also just created in the moment. That's kind of the nature of this, this art. And, and the longevity of it doesn't matter to us as much either. We're just there. We do this in like a weekend and we, we're, we're vibing off of each other and it's a total collaborative thing. But I know these people very well. I've known them for years. So I find it fascinating that when you do more of your, your street pieces that you don't necessarily intend them to have a long life. Whereas when you did the mural for Laredin, you that's something that you, we, you probably in community probably has an expectation that that's going to be around for a long time. And then when it gets damaged by the weather that you'll probably go back there and, and repair it. Um, yep. what, They're what it has that? UV protectant. It's, it's expected to live long and it's a public art piece. So it's very, so what makes them, why are they different? What makes them different? Well, I painted that one for people. I painted it for, for, for people in the community. I'm, I'm taking into account 
how I'm, I'm serving them, how I'm representing them. Um, I, I, I want my art to, to be a reflection of where it's at and to work with the environment in that sense. Uh, and the same for these walls to an extent, but you got to also understand sometimes graffiti is vandalism. Sometimes it's going against all of that. Um, so that's a part of it too. And I, and, and, and I express that too. And, and when I do fine art, sometimes it's abstract art. Um, but with the graffiti art, it's, it's really like a showcase of letters. It, it's a showcase of that. It's a showcase of abstracted typography. Um, these pieces say our names, but we've never used letters in that way. So, you know, how many times can you create the letter J? How many times can you recreate the letter O? How many times can you take a symbol and change it without it losing its original intent, but you're almost giving it a different power and a different energy every time you are. Um, and they're just different things. They're different energies that I'm, that I'm, I'm expressing at those times. I, I, I think the one with the, the like Virgen subject with the cosmos is really beautiful. Uh, beautiful and it, and it has a very strong, uh, the fact that you included the Virgen, it has a very strong cultural component in it. it it's, it's uh, and even though it's the, uh, maybe a nod to the Virgen de Guadalupe, it really has a universal uh, quality to it. That was, that was the goal. And, and, and specifically that wall being on Burrito Giant, I always keep something, use the opportunity, even though it's not a big mural and it's not planned out, I wanna use the opportunity to represent the, the culture and the community and paint something for the people. Growing up in the Northside Burrito Giant was on Pecos back in the day. I know Miguel very Oh yeah, well. I, re yeah I remember guy. that. Yeah, I know it is, so I'm uh, bothering with him. I go, I paint his wall and, and you know, I, I haven't paid for a burrito in years and that's a cool trade for me. Huh. I appreciate the opportunity, so I always try to do it. That's why there's a lowrider there now. And next time we change it, the, the environment will be taken into account every time. You know? So Juan, are you picking up some cans lately? <laughs> are, you, are you learning some technique? Maybe. Who Maybe? Knows? Or it's all in your book. <laughs> so talk to us, Juan, a little bit about your photography. We really didn't have enough time to um, uh, get into it earlier, but... I'd like to know more about how you got interested in photography. Who were your influences? How long ago did you start taking photographs and what are your subjects? Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't like pick up photography intentionally that long ago. Um, it was about three and a half years ago. Um, it, it was inspired through, through Instagram. I know it's like a, a weird space to be inspired through, but um, at the same time, I was just seeing how different photographers were approaching street photography. And to me, it just clicked because I had been in that culture for so long and not documenting it. And I, I just made that transition. I, I started taking photos with my phone. Uh, I was working downtown at the time, so I was documenting a lot of downtown just like with my phone. And I, 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 I got... Uh, let go from that job downtown and I had saved up some money and I said, you know what, I'm going to buy a professional camera. I had no um, education in it. I had no, I had not, I didn't know anything of the technical aspect of it. Uh, I just kind of threw myself in it. Uh, YouTube, some tutorials and stuff like that on how to like, you know, use a professional camera. But to me, I think photography really spoke to me because it was, it was a way to like, uh, you know, show my story, show my point of view of this city, show what I've been through um, in an easier way. Uh, I always, I think, wanted to be uh, 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 an artist in some sort of way. Um, you know, I, I picked up graffiti when I was young, but never took it anywhere. Um, then I started making music and then never took it anywhere. And I think photography really spoke to me in a different way where um, it was still like a creative outlet, but it was also came with like a purpose. Um, and I think these past three years have been just uh, a big focus on, on what's happening around the city, what's happening around my life. Um, but yeah. So uh, you have uh, maybe four photographs up 
at the Etron Colorado exhibit. What would you like people to take away from that show when they see your work? Man. I don't know. It's loaded, loaded question. <laughs> kind of tough because I'm still trying to take away my own. Uh, I think I'm amongst a lot of uh, people that I've respected for so many years amongst a lot of creative and artist, artists that have been doing the, the, that work with that same purpose of representing our culture, representing our people um, for over 50 years now. And I, I, I'm probably one of the youngest ones in there. Uh, I'm 29 years old. And like I said, I've only been doing photography for about three years. So my art career isn't like as extent as other people in there. So to me, I just wanted people to, to connect with it. I want people to, to feel that I, I'm, I'm capable of, you know, representing in that way with that with that uh, intent as well. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about some of the fellow photographers that you work with? Yeah, so the the, the first like when I first got into photography, uh, I started taking photos, photos uh, and kind of meeting up with this collective called They Shoot In um, that had been doing a lot of street photography in Denver and doing a lot of DIY events. And like the first photographs I ever exhibited were at these events. Um, one of them, uh, one of the creators of that is Armando Gennaro. Um, and yeah, through them, uh, Armando Gennaro, uh, uh, Jose Domingo, um, they, they all have different names on, on social media and stuff like that. But we were all just kind of getting together and taking photographs and in the street or like trying to document Denver in a, in a different way. Um, that was like my first influence. That was like my first jump into it. Like I said, that was like my first inspiration was through Instagram and I met a lot of these people through social media. Um, also, could, and I know you're spending a lot of time uh, sharing your skills and your, your experience with uh, uh, younger people. What programs are you working with? Yeah, so um, I've done a couple like workshops, I guess, with uh, Art Street uh, over at La Alma Park. Um, I've worked with uh, Red Lines um, Epic program for a couple years now. Uh, I've done programs with the Grow House and Swansea. Um, this, these next semesters, I'm going to be doing like visiting artists at a, a school in Montbello. I'm going to be doing a, kind of a workshop at UNC in Greeley. So I've just been kind of floating around different programs and trying to tap in with different, different age groups and different students. I love that you're working with the young people in community and, and uh, keeping that sense of community alive. So. Um, Joel, maybe you can give us an idea about what you got planned for your near future. And also, I want to give a shout out to your daughter, V, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and maybe talk to us a little bit more about uh, responsibility of, of passing on, you know, a legacy to the next generation. Um, so what's next is I'm designing three different murals right now. That's what I'm doing this week, uh, just drawing every day um, and those murals will be one will be in Boulder uh, one will be on Colfax West Colfax um, that's for the census 2020 they hooked me up with um, these, um, these people over there from one of the old hotels and I'm gonna do a mural there um, and then I'm gonna do a mural I have another one downtown so it, it, I have public art I've taken a break I've been chilling for like a month and I, it's the most that I've relaxed in a while, and it's been nice. So I'm excited to um, be focused, and and I'm excited to see what's next too, because I don't know what these things are going to be, and I don't know what's going to reflect after everything I've been through up to this point. But right I, right now, I'm ready. I'm ready to do art, and I'm very excited about it. Um, on top of that, I'm trying to build my own studio. I don't want to rent studios anymore. I want to own my own studio. Uh, at this point in my life, I'm almost 40, and I really want to do that. That's a goal of mine um, for the longevity of everything. And, um, and what was the third question? I just wanted to know, uh, 
your experience with passing on the the arts for, um, that just like how you grew up with the arts, how are you passing that on to your daughter? Oh, my daughter's an artist. She's it's it's just a part of our household and the same. Um, she's exposed to art. She's traveled all around the U.S. and abroad. She's been outside of this country. She's always exposed and around artists. Um, she creates art herself, uh, learning the technical abilities of creating art. She knows how to use a spray can, a paintbrush, pen, pencil, um, protractors. I mean, she just, just, you know, basic skills of teaching her how to use, how to use the tools. Uh, and then she's, she's exposed to it. She, she lives, my, my home is connected to my art studio. Uh, so this little girl has essentially just grown up with art her whole life and she's very talented at it. Um, so it's really cool to see. She, she was doing her schoolwork today and part of it was talking about what she wanted to be when she was older and she wants to be a professional artist. Uh, and I believe her that I, she, she's going to move in that direction too. So she, she's, I'm I love hearing that. that. That's excellent. Um, we're going to go ahead and open this conversation up to questions and Corey's going to lead that, uh, uh, those questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan and Jolt, for that great interview. And thank you, Adriana, for moderating. Um, it looks like we already do have a few questions in the chat box. Um, once again, if you have any questions, just please put them there. Um, first one looks like it's for Jolt, and it comes from Julia. She says, your work is so colorful. Is there a story behind color choice for these bigger pieces, like Lara Den Hall? Um. I think just an understanding of color theory, uh, call and response, contrast, knowing that one color mixed with another can create an energy. That there's a lot of magic that, that lies in knowing color. And I, I always try to use it in the most complementary ways that I can. Um, yeah. We have another question here. From in the documentary, if I can add to that. I say it uh, with the Globe and Mural, those hands are brown on purpose. Um, mm -hmm. They are, they're specifically brown to, to represent the hands of people that work in that community. Um, so if there's one color that did stand out, that would be, that would be the reason why. And if anybody's interested in seeing that documentary, I did post a link to that in the chat box and you can find the YouTube video online. Um, our next question comes from Debbie to Juan. She asked, do you shoot in digital or film? Uh, both. Um, just whatever I have at the time. <laughs> um, do you have a preference? Film to me captures this essence that can't really be replicated, but uh, sometimes digital is just a little bit more convenient, but I, I really don't have a preference. It's what I have at the time. The iPhone is great. Um, yeah. Another question for you, Juan, from Julia. How do you pick subjects for photographs? Are the photos usually staged, pre-planned, or more organic? Yeah, I never stage anything. I, I'm terrible even at, when people ask me for photo shoots and stuff like that, I tend to steer away because my, my approach is always very organic, very on the moment, uh, sometimes candid. Um, and yeah, it's just like a special, like the special moment or sometimes subjects are picked through like an energy, this connection, um, this, this, to me, um, some of my subjects are playing a role in people that reflect my story, people that are representation of somebody that I know through my story. And they, they, not, they, not, they might not be that person, but they show that energy or, or they, they, they even look alike or something. Yeah, yeah it, it, it always it always changes. But for the most part, it's, it's through, through a intuitive thing um, that, that just kind of makes you gravitate to certain people. Right. Uh, another question for Debbie. Jolt, where are the hummingbird murals located? It's in Boulder. Um, that's I think it's off of Flatiron, I believe. Uh, it's right behind the Boulder Public Library. 
And I know you said that was from the census in 2020. Can, can you tell us about that project? Um, that was a great opportunity because I created this mural. Um, the, the people that live right behind that wall um, were just really cool people. It was a great opportunity to meet a lot of really nice people and to, to grow the concept with them. But meanwhile, them, they, they really liked my art. They wanted me to do what I wanted to do. Um, but at the same time, I, I wanted to do something that they wanted to see too. And they wanted to see those hummingbirds. I wanted to continue the project and I hope in the future where I build a bunch of little homes for the hummingbirds as well so they can hang out right there. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, well, on behalf of uh, Team LCAC, I wanted to thank uh, Jolt and Juan for really giving voice to our community, especially um, the younger generations. I think uh, what you guys provide is, is, is a lot of inspiration um, just as uh, Leo Tanguma and Emmanuel Martinez inspired you, Jolt, and Jolt, you inspired Juan. It's, uh, I think it's amazing uh, what you guys are leaving for the younger generations to, to really be inspired and influenced by. If I could return the gratitude, I would say what you did with the Echo in Mexico show is incredible. Phenomenal. And the position that you're in and the importance that you move with it and how you are doing that and giving us these opportunities. Me and my brother right here are in a museum right now. That is a how we can't nobody no hey Joel, nobody told you we lost we 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 lost uh Colorado uh to the States in eighteen forty eight. You're still in the uh, Echo in Mexico time. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. I have a question here for both of you. It says, um, after people visit HO in Colorado, what do you want them to take away from the show? I mean, there's 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 a lot to be taken to take away from it. I think it, it should be an introduction to what has been happening on this land for the past 50 years. Um, the people that have been the voices, the people that have been the fighters, the warriors. Um, art, I feel like, plays a big role in movements, plays a big role in culture, in, a, in its storytelling. And sometimes our stories get uh, put to the side or, or, or erased with the purpose. And I think Echo in Colorado is an introduction to kind of remind people that we have been here and this has been our land. Um, and I hope they take away that not only are we a culture that is very talented and is capable of telling our stories in more abstract ways and just, you know, writing it or whatever it is, we, we can expand in so many different ways. And I think the, the Etch in Colorado exhibit shows that in different ways. You know, there's, I think, bits and pieces of the ways uh, different generations or different artists have approached that, um, I guess, telling our story. You want to add to that? I don't think I can, brother. I think you said it, said it quite perfect. Um, I have so, a, oh, go ahead, Adrian. Oh, can I ask a quick question? Um, Joel, who would you say or what piece in, what artist or what piece in the exhibit uh, is, um, stands out to you or, or calls out to you the most? Oh man, when I walk into that exhibit, maybe I, I don't know why I naturally go right, but I go right. Maybe, that, maybe I just move right every time I go to a gallery, I don't know. But I walk in and I see Casa Bonita and a gorilla, and I see that, and, and cow feet, and I think that's incredible. I've never met him, but I love his work. And then I move the cor corner, and then I see Armando, who, whom I've never met, and, and I know he's, he's my age, but I've always seen his work, and I love it. And that piece that you have uh, of his is incredible. In that. And then I move, and then I'm like, oh, man, there's Carlos. I, 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 know, uh, I know Los Jr. I grew up in the house knowing his dad's work. And I'm like, man, okay, damn, the OGs. Whoa, there's my work. 
damn, don't go home. We have the homies. And then, and then I see Juan's photos, and it takes me for a whole trip all the way through. I can't even say anything. I think the way that it was curated was phenomenal. I love it. When I look at the pictures, I see people that I know in the photographs. Not only do I appreciate the photographs, but I know the people in the photographs. So I see my car um the, like in the in Juan's photograph and I, I my my painting suit is there and then I used to live across the street from um Suavecitos from the zoot suit place oh, okay. so to see yeah. the zoot suit in there and then the hand-painted dresses you know and to see how my wife adores those and just looks at them and I can't say any, any one piece oh, but I family is in the pictures yeah, my too. wife's family's in there too we're, we're it, it's so embedded into just who we are like it's it's a trip to see but um when I do come all the way around aesthetically, um, Emmanuel's piece, the curandera. Is yes, that the yes, the painting La Curandera, uh, uh, painted in 1980. That piece, um, Emmanuel's work always has stood out to me, and the ability to use illustration, but with these hard lines and these color breaks that occur, that has has become his style. That piece does it so simply and so, so just so beautifully that it, it, it just aesthetically, that is the one that stops me and especially placement of it. Cause I've always loved that piece since the Museo did this book documenting his work. That's where I first seen that piece. So when I seen that it, in, in real life, it, it had an impact on me. We're almost out of time, but I just wanted to ask that question to Juan um, while we wind this up. Uh, were there any particular pieces uh, that hit home for you? I mean, yeah, I mean, all around, uh, for sure. I mean, resonate a lot with what Joel just said, but um, particularly, I think the thing that I like reflect on the most is the fact that, uh, you know, some of my pieces are literally next to uh, Juan Espinosa's photographs who, you know, he documented the, the you know, a lot of, a big portion of the, the Chicano movement. Um, and I think the, the photographic aspect of it is always what gravitates to what I gravitate to. And, uh, but <laughs> to be completely honest, that, that, that same Emmanuel uh, de Curandera piece is, is one of the most, the, the most standout pieces to me as well. Um, to me, I, I look at it and it, I see it in a photographic way because I see it happening in real life. I saw what he saw when he was inspired by that image. Uh, he was down in Mexico and he saw that lady looking out and I think I think that's what I see um but I don't know it's hard to really choose you know I think uh, Victor's in the in, in the room right now his piece uh I think his representation of Mayan culture is amazing as well um Leo Tanguma sketches it's like a fucking it's like a privilege to see uh it's just it's just great well, I want to, again, thank you guys. Uh, you make uh, uh, Raza uh, here in Colorado proud to have you be part of our artistic community. And uh, keep doing what you do. You guys are great. So thanks again. Great. Um, we do actually have two more questions here, if you wouldn't mind staying just for a little bit over to answer them. We'll hang out with you guys. Great. <laughs> Um, we have one from Manuel Ramos um, for, for Jolt. Uh, the stylized letters in the art, I can never read them. Are they meant to be read by the viewer or to convey meaning only to the creator? He's coming right back. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you said the stylized letters, are they meant to be read by the viewer or just make sense to the creator? Yeah, to convey meaning. Um, so graffiti is a representation of letters. We're graffiti writers. Before we considered ourselves graffiti artists, we're graffiti writers. And we're using letters. And those letters have to have an accurate, accurate structure of the letter. So they're meant to be read by those within the fold that understand how we're using the symbols. So the letters are there. Um, you just have to understand what's been added to the letters and how they've been moved. And once you understand that, you'll see a tradition of, of extra symbols within the art. Um, but yeah, if, if you tap in and you do your research, you'll learn to read what you're seeing on those walls. Um, and it's meant for you if, if 
you can tap into that if you, if you study it. And one last question from Evan Jolt. Um, how has gentrification affected the public murals that you have living in Denver? Good question. <laughs> when I was creating art with spray cans, there wasn't people that called themselves street artists that weren't of the streets. Your, your, your art that was considered street art came from street culture. And it came from a lineage and a, and a history of, of the streets of East LA and the streets of the Bronx and the streets of, of places that had stories to tell. And we used this art to tell those stories. Um, now street art is wallpaper for gentrification. Them same walls that we got arrested painting as youth, even though we were doing it legally, the police said we couldn't have spray paint, so they took us to jail. Those same walls are being painted by people that grew up with privilege from upstate, wherever, and and they're not creating the same art we're doing, and they don't even realize how it's being used. So the art within itself has been gentrified, but then the development of artistic communities, art studios, art districts, calling it an art district now is nothing more than like code word for a place where they're going to develop. I've had my art studios, my last few art studios were on 39th and Still, um, 35th and Brighton Boulevard, and 7th and Santa Fe, and I got ran out of all those the second those became art districts. Mm -hmm. I was, I, they've used what art is supposed to be as just development and you can look at it you can see it look at um look at overtown in, in dade county in miami they call it now winwood look look at um look at uh the the brooklyn what are they called brooklyn? Williamsburg? Or, uh, they they have like these like and, and it, that's the same thing like development has, has used that that title um so i've experienced that i trip out on it and, and I see it all the time. Did I answer that? Did I answer the question? Yeah, that was great. I just want to say thank you again, Juan and Jolt, for this amazing conversation. And, and thank you, Adriana, for moderating. And for everybody for attending today. We hope that this program has inspired you to come visit us at History Colorado when the time is right again. HR in Colorado is open to the public until January 10th. If you happen to come, if you happen to come late to this event, we will be posting all of the Voces and Arte programming to our History, Colo History Colorado YouTube page for future viewing. And I'm gonna post that and all of the rest of the links I'm about to mention in the chat right now. And I'd like to encourage anyone who doesn't follow the LCAC Denver uh, to please look us up on Facebook or Instagram. And we also have a, a great uh, web page, so please follow us. Um, as far as upcoming events related to HO in Colorado, uh, we have Cafe Citos every Friday at 9 a.m. And what that includes is a private tour from Adriana Arbarca with complimentary coffee and bisco chichos and admission into the museum afterwards. Um, but you do have to sign up soon as tickets are selling fast. Our next Vosis in Arte is Wednesday, September 16th, and that will be with painters Karma Lee and Arlette Lucero. Um, again, this is free just like this, but you do have to register in order to get the Zoom link. If you're interested in learning more about the history of Chicano and Mexicano people in Colorado, we encourage you to make an appointment at our research center at the History Colorado Center. Visitors can request to see artifacts and documents not on display free of charge. For more information, visit the research center's website. To learn more about our partners, the Latino Cultural Arts Center is on the verge of something truly special in the history of Denver that will elevate the artistic and intellectual contributions of the Latino and Chicano communities to a national level. They are developing a cultural campus across three locations in the Sun Valley and La Alma Park neighborhoods. Uh, visit lcacdenver.org for more information. And if you liked this program, please consider donating to support History Colorado so we can create more events like this. Thank you all again for attending and thank you to Adriana, Juan, 
a jolt for an engaging conversation. And also to Gloria Lopez for volunteering her time to interpretate this service. Um, we hope to see you all at the next Voces in Arte, uh, September 16th. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank you all. Bye. Good night.